Good morning. In 1977, NASA sent a spacecraft named Voyager out into the solar system to study our solar system. And after this uh, spacecraft had been exploring for 13 years, in 1990, it it was nearing the edge of our solar system. It was, at that point, around Pluto, 3.7 billion miles away from Earth. Uh, This was back when Pluto was still a planet. And and so as it was passing Pluto and and about to exit our solar system, NASA said, you know what, why don't we turn it around and have it take one last picture of our solar system before it exits and is forever gone. And so they did. They sent it a message, and it turned around, and it aimed its cameras back at the solar system. And it took a series of 60 photographs and it sent them back to Earth. It took months for the transmission to get back. And NASA got, the, got this image and they pieced it together. And, and what they got was perhaps one of the most astounding photographs I think you will ever see. It changed astronomy forever. I don't want to oversell this, but this, when I saw this picture for the first time, I was floored. This is what they got. Now, I know some of you may be thinking this looks exactly like the last two pictures of every roll of film I ever developed when I was growing up. But that is not. This is actually the picture of our solar system. And so what it is that you're looking at is those beams that come down are the sun reflecting off of the lens of the camera. And believe it or not, in this beam that's closest to me, Earth sits there as a pale blue dot. Can you see it? Let me help you see it. You may need to get closer, but that was what they saw. Carl Sagan, who was a well-known astronomer and atheist, looked at this, and he was giving a speech a few years later. And he said this about that dot. He says, that's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever lived, lived out their lives, the aggregate of all our joys and sufferings, every hero and coward, every king and peasant, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there on a mote of dust suspended in a sunbeam. That is rather sobering. Not only that, But you and I each represent one person out of 7.3 billion people who currently live on this mode of dust suspended in a sunbeam. Now, when an atheist looks at that, like Carl Sagan, he sees absolute utter terror. There has to be somebody else out there. And so they scour and search and look for some other life because it doesn't make sense for a universe that is that vast and that big to exist, if only for us to exist on this mote of dust suspended in a sunbeam. And if God made, from our perspective, all of this universe to house us on this little beam, I'm going to have to say he kind of overdid it. (laughs) But if he made the universe and the heavens to declare his glory, then I'd say he got it about right. And so it is with this perspective that that we come to Romans. And and Romans tells us, with this perspective of this massive universe and us on this tiny little dot, that we went and we made an absolute mess of things. We were destroying the earth. We were living in sin. And God, the one who made that universe, came and he said, I am going to go down to those people to make it right. I am going to live a life that they could not live. I am going to die the death that they deserved to die because I want to have a relationship with them. And so that is what he did. And this is what Romans 1 through 11 has been telling us. It has been setting us up with a picture of God that is so vast and so big. And it is setting us up a picture of us and our sinfulness that is so deep and we are so helpless that but for God's mercy, we are without hope. And so Paul has been setting this up. He's been setting us up in Romans 1 through 11 to say, you have to understand the mercy of God. You have to understand how big he is. In order to do that, you have to understand how sinful you are. 
but then how great his mercy is, which is him foregoing what we deserve, which is punishment, and giving us what we don't deserve, which is forgiveness. And so with that stage, Paul says, now you know who God is and what he's done. What do you do? And Romans 12 is the flip that happens in almost every letter from Paul where he says, therefore, (laughs) and he begins to tell you what you should do because of what he has been telling you. So we move from the theological into the practical this morning. And we'll start right away in Romans 12, verse 1. Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Paul is saying, I appeal, which is literally to urge. It's an interesting word because the root of this word is the same word that Jesus uses to describe the Holy Spirit. So Paul is saying, come alongside me. It's like, hey man, the water's great, come on in, right? I've been living this way. So I appeal to you, come with me. And he's saying, in light of God's mercy, what I just talked about, in light of God's great mercy, come along and live with me. And I have to think that when Paul wrote these words, When he said, I appeal to you, I urge you, come with me, he had a big, giant smile on his face. He wasn't saying, come pick up an anchor and drag it with me. He was saying, come live with me in the joy that I have experienced when I respond to God's mercy in this way. And so I think we need to read all of this with great joy because I think that is how Paul would have written it. And then he calls us, he says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to God. In the Old Testament, there were two kinds of sacrifices. There was a guilt, sin sacrifice, and there was a sacrifice of thanksgiving and praise. Now, the sacrifices in the Old Testament were spotless sheep or goats that were slaughtered, right? They they didn't come to the altar and walk away. That was their last breath that they took. And not only that, They weren't this sick, gross, weak goat that you kick every time you walk by because you have to feed the thing and you just hope it dies in a storm. This was their prized, best in show lamb. Perfect, white, fluffy that they had to bring and sacrifice on the altar. And so we now move to a place where we no longer need guilt sacrifices. And what's interesting is the Jews no longer sacrifice guilt sacrifices. And why is that? We know that's because Jesus came and he died for us. And he was the spotless lamb. He was the sacrifice that we needed in order to make us right with God. So now all we're left with is these sacrifices of thanksgiving. And that is what Paul is calling us into. He tells us to offer ourselves as living sacrifices. And so we move from make a sacrifice to be a sacrifice. And there's a fundamental difference between making and implying. Making is a one-time thing. Each one of those lambs died once. Paul is calling us to become, change our lives as we become living sacrifices. The, The best example I could think of with this on Mother's Day was mothers. I think you understand this very, very well, the difference between making a sacrifice and being a sacrifice. Think of it this way. If if you wake up in the morning, you have your day planned, you have all these things you need to accomplish and you go to wake up your child and they have a fever. Their stomach hurts. And so what happens? You change your day and you make a sacrifice of that day in order to care for your child. Now, when we become a sacrifice, I think it, it often is represented when a mom becomes a mom. I mean, think about this. Your body is taken over for nine months by an alien living inside of you. And then they come out and they still try to take over your body and control it for a long time. And so you live this life where you somehow manage to have 52 different things going at the exact same time. You know where everyone needs to be and what needs to be done and how it needs to happen. And your husband's standing over next to the sink trying to make hamburgers and figure out what time to put them on so they can be done in time for dinner. And he can't handle anything else at the time. You plan out these meals for your family and they all sit down and go, oh, gross. I don't want this. And yet somehow at night, you still hug your kids and you still give them a kiss and you still love them. 
And so when you think about a mom and Mother's Day, you don't hear many mothers say, man, I regret having those kids. (laughs) Every now and then you may say that. (laughs) At the end, you know, way, way long, when your memory begins to fade. I mean, how else do you explain why any woman has two children? (laughs) The sheer horror of birth alone would keep me from having a second child. But yet, somehow, our minds forget. And what do you hear other mothers say to mothers all the time? Hold on to these days. Cherish these days with your kids, because they go quickly. And so this is the difference between being a sacrifice and making a sacrifice. And I believe, just like a mom doesn't look back with regret, we may have times when we live as living sacrifices that it's hard. But I believe we will look back with joy every single time and say, man, that was absolutely worth it. I wish I could go do it again. And so this is what we are being called into. And the type of sacrifices Paul tells us to be are holy and acceptable, just like the perfect spotted lamb. But here is the really good news about that, is you are not responsible for making yourself holy and acceptable. That has been done for you. When Jesus came and he died for us, he made us holy and acceptable so that we now have something worth offering as a sacrifice to God. Not because of us, but purely and 100% because of him. And then finally, he ends us with a really interesting translation in the uh, English Standard Version, which is what we're using this morning. He says, which is your spiritual worship? Now you might read that and say, what isn't all worship perhaps spiritual worship? What this word also means, and if you read in other translations, is it's your rational response, your reasonable response. So Paul is saying that this is an informed sacrifice. When you think of Romans 1 through 11, this is the reasonable response is to offer yourselves as living sacrifices. Jesus shows us this same thing throughout the New Testament. I I did a study one time on where Jesus said, follow me throughout Uh, the New Testament. And every single time, every single time, it was accompanied by some sacrifice. And I want to read to you one of perhaps the harshest calls that he gave uh, on this sacrifice to make a point. In Luke 14, 26, before this, it says great crowds were around him. He's not talking to a small group of people here. He turns around to this great crowd and he says to them, if anyone comes to me, and does not hate his own father and mother, happy Mother's Day, by the way, if I haven't said it, and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost whether he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it began to mock him saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Just a a word of explanation on this word hate. It doesn't literally mean you are to despise your family. But what it means is that you are to hold God in such a high regard. Your love for him is to be such uh, preeminent in your life that the way you love your family would appear as hate. It, it, It is drawing a contrast between the two. Okay, but it's, it is stark. He is saying, you need to love me. And so after he has painted this somewhat grim picture, and he tells them to count the cost of following him. He says, you need to count the cost of whether it is worth following me. In order to do that, you have to ask yourself, is Jesus worth it? Do I believe that the creator of the universe who came and died for me is worth following? Do I believe that when I make this exchange, if you will, of my life for a relationship with him, that it is in fact a good deal? It's not perhaps an even trade or or a little bit, that it's in fact a good deal. So when we use words here like sacrifice and like cost, I think it conjures up in our minds this idea of giving up something and not getting something equal in return. When it is absolutely the opposite that both of these are saying. Because I believe that the cost is not high if we have valued Jesus in eternity properly. If we understand who he is and what he did, the cost is not high. The cost seems high when we view Jesus as our ticket out of hell. 
because a ticket is discarded after it has been used up. But instead, when we, when we view him as our treasure for eternity, our perspective changes. Because it is so short-sighted of me to live for 30 years from now instead of for 30 million years from now. And if eternity is a reality, then the cost is not high to give up something here in light of eternity. So I don't believe abandoning all, giving up all to follow Jesus is a sacrifice. It is just smart. And so Paul, after painting this picture and telling us to value Jesus properly, tells us how to begin to change. He tells us how to live as living sacrifices. In verse two, and, I, and those of you who, who are time sensitive, I understand where I am on time and that I'm just in verse two, but we have plenty of time. Romans 12, two says this, it says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So the world here implies the age. It, it, it implies the, the methodologies, the philosophies of this age, this time. And so Paul says, do not be conformed to this age. Conformed is a really interesting word because it's a passive verb. And so what that implies is it implies that things are acting on us from the outside. And so uh, at, at some way, on a subconscious level, the world is always trying to make us look like it. And I think we do this in the church as well. I think we tend to try to Christianize the world's patterns to make them feel okay. Uh, it's like we try to put a little bit of a holy shine on things that we want to be okay. You see this in our lifestyles. You see this in the way we consume culture. You see this in the way we put politicians up as our saviors. And, and it's... Um, it's often present, I think, as well in, a, in places that I don't even recognize, that are just hidden. And, and I have just become naturally conformed because the world is passively trying to change me into somebody that looks like it. And so when I, when I allow this to happen and when I allow these values to influence my life, I begin to evaluate everything as, this, as if this life, this age, were more important than the age to come. But what we know is that this world is under the dominion of Satan. It says in 1 John 5, 19, that we know that we are from God and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. So when we are conforming to the world, we are allowing Satan to conform us to himself. Now, it doesn't look like a bunch of people running around with horns and pitchforks, does it? It's much more subtle than that. And so Paul says, instead of being conformed, we are to be transformed by renewing our minds. And what's interesting here as well is that this word transformed is also a passive verb. So both conformed and transformed are passive verbs. But he gives us the formula for being transformed. He says, renew your minds. You need to make them new. And we do this by spending time with God and his word and understanding his grace. And so Paul is saying, instead of passively letting the world conform you to itself, be active in your transformation of changing to look like the world. <clears throat> and so then he says that when we do this, when we choose to re renew our minds, we become people transformed into ones who can discern what the will of God is. And that is the result of it. So we have these two choices. We have either the world able to subconsciously act on us, or we, or we have the option to be active in what we pursue. Paul is telling us you will become like the things that you spend your time on. Whether you are aware of it or not, you are being changed into the things that you are spending your time on. And if you're not intentionally spending time with God in his word, you are going to miss out on the opportunity to be transformed. And you will be conformed to the world. If all our discretionary time is spent watching television, reading secular books, listening to secular music, and not at all concerned with the things of God. It would be a miracle if you did not look fundamentally secular in your life, period. I'm not saying you can't have leisure. I'm not saying you can't enjoy the art 
that God has given us the ability to create. But I would like to challenge us all this morning of, I think, a deep-seated belief that leisure cannot be found in God. I believe too often we think, I am worn out. I just need to veg. God is the Lord of the Sabbath. He created us for rest in him. And so I would like us to challenge the fact that we can find rest in him and not look to something else to find us, give us rest or restoration, but to seek it from him. So here's the cool thing about these two words. When we think about being conformed and we think about being transformed is, <clears throat> excuse me, is that when we are conformed, it implies an outward change. Okay, so we begin to look like the world, like I said. But transformation comes from the word metamorphosis. Or we get our word metamorphosis from the word transformed. And so it has this implication of like a butterfly changing. So I, I have this picture of as we renew our minds, it is as if we are, we are pouring into our insides. And as we begin to renew them, it is as if we break out of the conformed image of the world as we are transformed, because it is a change from the inside out. It is not just a change in what we look like. And so that is the good news of when we choose to begin to renew our minds, the transformation changes the whole thing. And so when this all happens, we begin to desire the will of God. That's what he says. We begin to discern the will of God. And what I, what I also believe is that it is not hard to discern the will of God, what is hard is to want to do it. And so as we, as we learn to discern it, sometimes the particular part can be challenging. I'll give you that on the will of God, but we know in his word what he wants us to do. He wants us to love our neighbors and to love him. He wants us to share his truth with others. He wants us to serve the poor and the widows and the orphans. That is very clear. And, and, and so... As, as we begin to tr be transformed, we begin to have these desires to want those things more than we want the desires of our own lives. And, and so Paul now has given us um, or, uh, two verses that we could probably spend four weeks on in here, studying and looking. And he's calling us to be a living sacrifice. And now in the last bit of the chapter, he tells us, how do we live as transformed people? What does it look like? And there are two places that he talks about that we do this. One, in our relationships with people and two, how we relate to the church. And so the purpose that he gives us for all of this is our, our responding to his mercy in order to know him and make him known. We know him in the church and we make him known in our relationships with other people. And so in Romans uh, 3, 12, 3 through 5, he says this, for by, by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of truth that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. So Paul begins by saying, look, as you relate to one another, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. Even Paul himself said, I am merely an apostle because of the grace given to me. I was only in this position because God appointed me to do so. I am not special. I do not have an extra bit of grace than you do. That's what he means when he says each one with, uh, according to the measure of his faith. He's not saying some people have this much faith and some people have this much faith. This is actually a great equalizing statement between the Jews and the Gentiles who were having trouble in this church. He says, you all are the same because you all have been given faith. So do not become too proud of yourself or think of yourself too highly. And so we do this as one body. We do this as we live together, many people with different functions, belonging to another. We don't love each other because the other person is useful. We love each other because we're connected to one another as a body. See, I, I think of imagining a hand crawling around like from uh, the Adams family, trying to do the work of God on his own or, or a little eyeball on a, in a jar just bobbing here, trying to reach people 
for Christ. It doesn't make any sense. We do this together as a body and because that is what we are called to do. And when we do this, it is an expression of love and it is a testimony to the outside world of who God is. Think about the early church. The early church during the first 300 years of its existence, there is not a single sermon, letter, writing, anything recorded about evangelism. They didn't have like this big evangelism explosion campaign. But yet the church grew by about 30% every single year for 300 years. 51% of all of Rome had become Christians by the time Constantine made it the official religion of Rome. And the reason it grew was because of the peculiar love and relationship that the Christians had with one another. They lived as a body. They loved each other as if it was their own body. And so Paul says, this is how you need to view each other as necessary parts of yourself. And then he moves on to tell us how we do that. How do we relate to one another? In six, uh, verses six through eight, he says, having gifts that differ according to the grace given us, Let us use them, if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. So just like Paul, Paul says, you have also been given grace of a gift. And my gift is not better than your gift. All of our gifts are pure grace. In 1 Peter 4.10, Peter tells us that as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace, varied grace. We have all been gifted. You are all important to the body of Christ. Every single one of you is important to the body of Christ. There is not one person in here who is more important than another person. Just because there are are gifts that you see used more visibly means nothing. We are all here for the glory of the church. We are all going to be gone in 50, 60, 70 years. But this church, the church of God will remain. Paul is kind of funny in how he talks about using the gifts. He's kind of simplistic. He's like, look, don't overthink this. If you serve, serve. If you teach, teach. It's like, don't, if, if your gift is jumping, don't walk around asking, how, how do I jump off of one foot? Maybe do I, do I get a running start? Do I stand on a table? He's like, man, just jump, just jump. Don't overthink this. There are other gifts listed in other parts of the Bible. So this list is not complete. He is saying, God has made you in a certain way to serve my body. If there are things that, that bother you when you walk around church, take that as a prompting from the Holy Spirit, not to, to fill out a complaint card, but to move into a, to an area of service. Because I think that may be a place where the Holy Spirit is, is convicting you and saying, look, you obviously care about this. So move in that area. One gift is not better than the others. All of us have simply been called to use them. And so when we understand God, when we understand the universe, when we understand ourselves in his place, we understand our role is simply to build the church. And then he says, this is how you live in relationship to other people as you are transformed. He moves into verses nine through 21. This is an interesting section because it's kind of a bridge. Nine through 13 is kind of a bridge between eight and 14, but it's also kind of its own. This whole section, nine to 21, has no organizing theme to it. (laughs) It's literally, it's just kind of a, a, a random collection of thoughts by Paul. So some of it relates to the church, some of it relates to people outside the church, some of it relates to family. It's just, it's kind of all over the place. And what I love is this, uh, Phil said this on Friday when we were talking about the sermon, is that it's messy just like our life. But all of it can be organized probably under this very first phrase of let love be genuine. Let your love be sincere. This love is not the emotional kind of love, the touchy-feely love that we get when we fall in love. This love is a choice. It is a mindset of love and saying, I am going to love no matter what. And what is, what is true about all of this is that we cannot do this unless we are transformed. These things that we're gonna look at briefly and over these next 13 verses, we cannot do unless we are transformed. 
So let's dive into these. We're gonna move pretty quickly through all of them. I wanna touch on them. And then I want you guys to dive into these in your small groups. So Paul says this, he says, let love be genuine, abhor what is evil, literally hate anything that tries to steal God's glory. Hold fast to what is good. Cling to the things that bring God glory. Oftentimes we follow evil, not because we think it's better, but because it's easier. We haven't seen the difference. And so not until our minds are renewed, will we begin to, see, to have the desire to do, to, um, to, to do good more than evil. And so I think that is what he is saying there. And then in verses 10 through 13, he says, love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another, outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saint and saints and seek to show hospitality. This is, this is fairly... Uh, uh, interesting here as well, because uh, the first two and the last two really relate to our relationship with people and the middle relate to our relationship with God. And so they're, they're connected to me because this, when we show concern for others, it motivates our relationship with God. And our relationship with God motivates our concern for one another. So he's, he's grouping these all together to say, when you do these things together, they both grow. And I think the final uh, part here, seek to show hospitality is kind of the sum of this. He's saying literally seek to show kindness, pursue kindness for strangers and guests. We are all called to hospitality. This is not a gifting that you need to figure out if you have. We are all called to hospitality. And then he moves in verses 14 through 21 into a bit of more focused on the outside world, persecution perhaps. And these can be really, really hard. In 14 to 15, he says, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. Blessing is way beyond tolerating. It is invoking a divine blessing on these people. He's saying, identify with people where they are. The reason I group these two together is because he's quoting Jesus from the Sermon on the Mount. He is saying, you must look at others in this way. In verse 16, he says, live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Again, on the pride, don't think of yourself too good for anybody. Remember yourself as the one in 7.3 billion people. And just because I can jump two feet closer to the other edge of the Grand Canyon, like Toby reminded us, doesn't make me better. Forget the pride. Remember where you are and who you are. In verse 17, he says, repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. When we repay evil with evil, we damage our witness and nothing is worth that. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. If possible, this means don't give up what the Bible says and tells you to do morally. But if possible, don't just think your ways are better than other people. Don't just say, well, I like the way I do it better. If possible, live at peace. And then in 19 through 20, he says, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Not a lot of sermons preached on that verse by itself. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. So what in the world are we talking about here? What Paul is saying is that when we retaliate, when we don't retaliate, we literally give a place for the wrath of God. We give it room to work. God's wrath is working a redemptive purpose. He is redeeming the world through his wrath. And so when you and I retaliate, what we do is we actually work against his redemptive purpose. So instead of doing that, he says, meet their needs, feed them, give them something to drink. And in order to do this, we have to be okay with this person who has hurt us being forgiven. And that may be one of the hardest things to do. But if we understand who we are and what we have been given, it becomes much, much easier. And then this last little bit of heaping burning coals is kind of a weird thing. It represents an Egyptian ritual where they would literally carry around in a basin coals on their head. And it would burn them and it would cause them to repent. So, so what he's Paul is saying is when people are, are, are mean to you, treat you poorly, treat them well. And what it will do is it will cause them to look at their own behavior, realize how wrong it was and repent. And then we are working in God's redemptive plan. And then he closes in verse 21 with do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with evil 
good. We do not defeat evil with more evil. Your mom says two wrongs don't make her right, and she is right. We do this with good, and this only comes when we have a transformed life. Jesus did not come to make bad people good. He came to make dead people alive. He came to change dead sacrifices into living sacrifices. And when we live as living sacrifice, we do two things. We bring God glory as we're properly responding to his mercy and we draw people to God. I think too often when we think of living as living sacrifices, we think of our lives like this. We think of our lives like a $100 bill. And we think of giving it all in one foul swoop where it goes up like a martyr's death and burns. But I think what Paul is saying is your life as a living sacrifice as a living sacrifice looks a lot more like this. You are giving it in nickels and dimes and pennies all the time, over and over and over. And I believe that faithfulness in the same direction for a long time is as bright of a burning fire as a martyr's death. And I think that is what we are being called into today. So let us go and live as living sacrifices renewing our minds so that we can be transformed. And I believe we will look back with joy and say, look at what God has done. I'm gonna invite the worship team back up and the prayer team to the sides. Let me just pray for us as we go into our time of worship. Dear God, thank you so much for your grace in our lives. Thank you for your mercy. Give us a big view of you, of who you are and what you have done for us. Let us be people who live as living sacrifices. We love you and praise your name. Amen.